Reverend Sun Myung Moon, founder of the Unification Church, passed away at the age of 92. On September 3, 2012, Reverend Sun Myung Moon passed away. The world took notice of his passing. The funeral procession continues on and on. Crowds of people of every nationality and race, leaders from around the world, members of the Unification Church, as well as religious leaders from other faiths came to offer their condolences. Extraordinary leadership going beyond race and nationality. I invested all my energy throughout my life to make a peaceful world. Playing a role in promoting actions that maintain peace. Let us take another look at the life of Reverend Sun Myung Moon, whom many have praised for his lifetime efforts to establish a wide range of activities to promote world peace in every nation around the world and for his concern regarding the reunification of Korea. World Peace Center. Following the guidance of Reverend Moon in 2007, an international convention center was built in Pyongyang. After hearing that Reverend Moon had passed away, all memorial altars were set up to offer incense and flowers to his memory, and North Korean Deputy Director of National Defense, Sung Tae Jang, and Yang Gun Kim came to offer respects to Reverend Moon on behalf of North Korean Chairman Kim Jong-un. They also presented Reverend Moon with the National Reunification Prize, frequently emphasizing the importance of solidarity for peace and unification. The National Reunification Prize, established in 1990, has been awarded to Kim Gu, Un Hyung Yo, and others. Now the award has been presented to Sun Myung Moon. It is an award given to recognize the patriotism of those who contributed to peaceful unification. Why did North Korea give Reverend Moon this award? In 1991, Reverend Moon and North Korea made a connection that defied the trend of the times. On December 6, 1991, Reverend Moon arrived in Pyongyang. It was an unusual event. A well-known figure visited North Korea, and North Korea welcomed him. Reverend Sun Myung Moon traveled to Pyongyang for a private talk with Supreme Leader Kim Il-sung. Their meeting was an epic-making event. Why did Reverend Moon go to North Korea in 1991? For us, the North and South situation is a constant concern. When the Soviet Union and the countries in the Communist bloc began to lose their influence, war could have suddenly broken out between North and South Korea. In order to prevent that from happening, it would be good to meet Kim Il-sung and become friends. After arriving in North Korea, Reverend Sun Myung Moon met with top party leaders of the North at the Man Su Day Assembly Hall. At the meeting, he gave a risky speech. No one, including Ki Bo Gyun and the head of the delegation from the North, could possibly have imagined that Reverend Moon would say such things. Juche ideology is an incorrect ideology. It is an inadequate ideology. This was a very frank statement. Chairman Yoon. Was what I said incorrect? He asked. Just like he was talking to an elementary school student. Chairman Yoon, tell me what you think. Using Juche ideology, can you bring reunification of North and South? Can you bring worldwide unification? No, it is not possible. There is no possibility based on Juche. Even though Reverend Moon had spoken bluntly, criticizing Juche ideology, Kim Il-sung welcomed him warmly. At that time, international pressure on North Korea regarding the nuclear inspection issue was increasing, and relations with the South were critical and sensitive. With matters in North Korea in such a state, there was nothing easy or safe about visiting Kim Il-sung at this time. Why did North Korea welcome the visit of Reverend Moon? Most likely, North Korea considered him a religious leader with worldwide influence. Their intention was based on an expectation that he would exert that influence and take the role of arbitrator for North and South reconciliation and cooperation 
allowing the North Korean regime to receive assistance in assuring their security or at least reducing their risk. And even though the likelihood that he would really be able to do that was strongly to the contrary, nevertheless, they invited him to visit the North. So what do the two talk about? Looking at the points agreed upon by Reverend Moon and Kim Il-sung, they included reunions for the divided families, international nuclear inspections, and the development of Mount Kumgong, and other issues including North-South economic interchange and summit meetings. So when did Reverend Moon begin to work for unification like this? With the October Revolution in 1917, Russia's imperial power collapsed and Lenin, who had established the communist regime, quickly moved to start setting up an international communist organization. Communism expanded throughout the world. We will have successful revolutions in many countries. In the 1920s, the activity of the Chinese Communist Party began to expand to Japan and elsewhere in Asia. Soviet influence expanded and efforts aimed at the communization of other countries gained momentum. From 1945, the Cold War era began with the Soviets siding against the United States. In the 1960s, Reverend Moon started his victory over communism activities in earnest. Reverend Moon's first focus was on Japan. Reverend Moon made a determination to transform Jo Chung Byun, a Korean organization in Japan that was sympathetic to the North and had strong influence at that time. The members of Jo Chung Dun considered North Korea as their homeland. And because this was not a group of just a few people, but a large organization with an estimated 290,000 members who had hostile feelings toward South Korea, the same kind of hostile attitude that North Korea has toward South Korea. But this was a group that took the hostile attitude one step further. Victory over communist activities in Japan began at Joseon University, which had been established by North Korea in order to indoctrinate university students from the Jo Chung Young community. Of course, they had strong control over the Jo Chung Young students. The work was very difficult. They followed the patterns of the communist revolution, which moved extremely quickly. It was a group with a very strong ideology that made the situation more dangerous. Reverend Moon headed to Japan to begin his victory over communism campaign. In Japan, he gave lectures and he began to encourage Jo Chung Dun leaders to visit their homeland. He created a victory over communism organization throughout Japan and he had already given 129 lectures himself, shedding sweat and blood in Japan. He traveled east and west, north and south, and won Jo Chung Dun over through Japanese members by inviting them to seminars in the United States. When Reverend Moon met them there, he gave them lectures on topics such as why democracy is a superior ideology, who are the Korean people, what is the problem with communism and other related topics, convincing them to change their attitudes and to visit Korea, bringing not just a handful, but more than a thousand people. North Koreans living in Japan visit in 1974, and this is the first time in Korea since 1945. In order to bring big unity, it is first necessary to make small unity. Everything is connected. He did not stop after the homeland visit campaign, but continued on. If we look back at the records, we can see that the cost of one Jo Chung Dun visit to Korea cost 350 million yen. Victory over communism work began in the 1960s. The most active campaigns took place during the 1970s. The campaign in Japan had great success and led to the development of a much stronger base of support. This made a strong influence on the Victory Over Communism campaign in Korea. In 1975, Reverend Moon held a rally to save the nation of Korea on Yoido, a large island in the Han River in Seoul, based on the situation of communization in Indochina at the time. The rally was called to recognize the threat to Korea and to determine the fight against it. There will be a rally to save the nation of Korea here in Yoido Island Plaza. Please attend the rally at 3 p.m. on June 10th, 1975. 
People from many nations who supported Reverend Moon's victory over communist activities spread the news about the rally to local citizens. It was an unparalleled event for the time. Finally, on the day of the rally, there were more than 1,000 guest participants from 60 different countries. Approximately 1.2 million people gathered from around Korea. There were many successful victory over communism activities in Japan and Korea in the 1970s. Reverend Moon also conducted extensive activities in the United States. At the same time in the United States, after the U.S. defeat in the Vietnam conflict, sexual immorality and illegal drugs were causing disorder in society. The American spirit, which had emphasized God and family as top values, was getting weaker. Reverend Moon was concerned about this problem in the United States. There was nobody who was thinking about saving America, and it was a time when despair in America could carry over to the despair of the world. Who will take responsibility for America? Who can guide Washington in the right direction so that the world will move in the right direction? Reverend Moon felt that he was the one who could do something about this problem. From the beginning of the 1970s, Reverend Sun Myung Moon began to work actively in the United States. This unknown minister from Asia conducted activities across the United States. Americans began to listen to his message that it was time for America to wake up. And the support of his work expanded across the United States. Then the press began to take notice. In September 1976, in the capital of the United States, 300,000 people attended a rally held on the mall in front of the Washington Monument. The attendance record set by that rally remains unbroken even today. Reverend Moon's voice echoed loudly as he called upon America to return to its righteous ideology. Huge crowds gathered for every rally. The rallies had an impact on American society. In addition, in the year-end edition of Newsweek, Reverend Moon was chosen as Man of the Year. Reverend Moon spoke at the House of Representatives and elsewhere, his message becoming more and more passionate. His influence in the United States gradually increased. Reverend Sun Myung Moon, bringing change in the United States, began to take a keen interest in the media. In response, The Washington Times was established. The inaugural edition of The Washington Times was created in 1982 and stood in the opposition to the left-leaning journalist. This was one of the results stemming from Reverend Moon's victory over communist activities in the 1970s. There was a photo this big with a headline saying, News World predicts a landslide win by Reagan. I went to visit Reagan, taking with me a copy of the paper. This photo planted the idea in many people's minds that Reagan would win. This was Reverend Moon's uncommon strategy in the presidential election. Reverend Moon believed that a victory for Reagan, a conservative, was important in order to defeat communism. From then on, the Washington Times became firmly established as a conservative newspaper. It wasn't always the popular thing to do, but you were a loud and powerful voice. Like me, you arrived in Washington at the beginning of the most momentous decade of the century. Together, we rolled up our sleeves and got to work. And, oh yes, we won the Cold War. In difficult times, even more than in easy ones, 
the voice of conservatism must make itself heard in the media. It isn't always easy. It wasn't easy when the paper's founder, Dr. Moon, first began the Washington Times. And I'd be remiss if I did not thank the founder of the Washington Times, Reverend Moon, uh, for his vision in launching this newspaper and others like it. Without him, there would be no Washington Times, and I think it's appropriate that we pay our respects to him. In 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. With the collapse of the Communist bloc, Reverend Moon's predictions were borne out. Reverend Moon visited the Soviet Union in April 1990. At the time, the Soviet Union did not have diplomatic relations with South Korea. At that time in the Soviet Union, communism was losing its influence and reform activities were gaining momentum. <laughs> Reverend Sun Myung Moon had private talks with President Gorbachev. Reverend Moon offered his firm support for President Gorbachev's reform policies of perestroika and glasnost. <laughs> He made several proposals. These included Russian-Korean relations, economic cooperation, support for peaceful reunification, and allowing religious freedom. There was one interesting proposal among them. The proposal was an invitation to 3,000 Soviet university students to visit the United States and to receive support for their education. This proposal was accepted, and 3,000 Soviet university students went to the United States for education. Reverend Moon wanted to introduce these students to new values, thus opening a new era. The Soviet Union finally disbanded in 1991. In the process, a coup d'etat was attempted in response to Gorbachev's freedom and reform policies. Russian citizens' opposition stopped the coup d'etat in just three days. At the vanguard of the citizens gathered in opposition were the 3,000 university students who went to the United States for education. Finally, the Soviet communist power that had shaken the world during the 20th century had collapsed. After this, Gorbachev visited Korea and met Reverend Moon. In some ways, Reverend Moon had saved his life. The two met after earth-shaking events. What they talked about was world peace. North Korea, the communist country with the strongest ideology, still remains. In 1994, tensions were high between North and South Korea. There were suspicions that North Korea was developing nuclear weapons. One year earlier, in March of 1993, North Korea announced that it would withdraw from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, bringing the first nuclear crisis to a climax. It was announced that the U.S. would direct bombs toward North Korea, and the North Korean delegation came to Panmunjom and made threats against Seoul, bringing tensions to a point just short of war. IAEA conducted nuclear inspections in North Korea. However, the IAEA said that the results of their inspections were inconclusive and requested additional facility inspections. North Korea's strong opposition. Young Soo Park, who was in Seoul at the time, while making preparations for a summit meeting between Kim Il-sung and Kim Yong-sam, proclaimed that Seoul become an inferno. Seoul is not far from here. If war breaks out, Seoul will become an inferno. It will be difficult for even Mr. Jung to survive. Are you really saying that? Do you think that we will just sit idly by? This is an issue that needs some deliberation. Are you threatening war? In a situation with a high risk of war, in order to block this possibility, Reverend Moon took special measures. He sponsored a North and South Youth Students Peace Seminar. The students opened a gate for reconciliation for North and South Korea in Beijing, China. Because it was such a sensitive time, the conference attracted international attention. Students from North and South Korea discussed the road to peaceful unification. They traveled around China together, forging friendships. The North-South Youth and Student Peace Seminar also included various sports events and cultural exchange events. There was time for singing and talking. After their experience together, the students from the North and South became one. They delivered a peace message to their countries, saying that it was not necessary to go to war. North and South could find unity 
and they brought a strong message that what they wanted was peace and unification. They applied all their energy to dispel the spirit of war. After that, every time the political situation on the Korean Peninsula became strained, South and North Youth Students Peace Seminar offered a lifeline to solve the situation. Be it the international situation or the North Korean nuclear problem, no matter how sensitive the time, Reverend Moon's unification activities have never ceased. There is no doubt that he has served as a catalyst for the atmosphere that can lead to reconciliation and North-South peace. After the threat of war had passed, the North and South once again began to work toward preparations for a summit meeting. But soon after that, in July 1994, with the death of Kim Il-sung, North-South relations entered a new phase. North Korea had lost its dear leader, the shock envelope North Korea. The funeral of Kim Il-sung clearly showed the impact of his death on North Korea. North Korean citizens plunged into deep grief. The entire city of Pyongyang was at a standstill. The situation was front page news. We did not know what kind of changes would lie ahead. Reverend Moon had continued to develop cordial relations with North Korea after his visit. With the sudden death of Kim Il-sung, there was a risk the door of interchange could be closed. Reverend Moon sent Bohe Park, President Sege Times, to attend the funeral on his behalf. We had more work to do together. If we had had just a little more time, the situation on the Korean Peninsula could have made great progress. Delegations from many countries traveled to North Korea to offer their condolences. This is the protocol that accompanies the death of a head of state. However, the South Korean government decided not to send a delegation, which the North Koreans took as an insult. Reverend Moon sent a delegation. At that time, I was president of the Sege Times. I did not want to have people complaining that I, a person in the position as president of a daily newspaper, had secretly traveled to North Korea. So I visited the Minister of National Security. The minister did not meet me in person, but I met with his vice minister, who said that we don't know about Kim Jong-il's health, whether his health is bad and he could collapse any time, or whether he seems to be healthy. We don't know anything about him. We need somebody who can check on this situation for us. If you can make a visit of condolence, if you can visit North Korea as the president of a daily newspaper, we would very much welcome the idea of such a visit. From the point of view of the Ministry of National Security, this would be very good. They welcome the idea of my attending the funeral. After receiving permission from the government, Dr. Bohe Park made his personal unofficial trip to Pyongyang. He met with Kim Jong-il in person to offer his condolences. Reverend Moon's decision was correct. He valued the relationship with Kim Il-sung and hoped for future cooperation. However, he was strongly criticized by the South Korean press. I had to hold a press conference, but there was somebody who said he wanted to meet me for just five minutes before the press conference. I asked who it was and learned that it was somebody from the Ministry of National Security with whom I still have a close relationship. There is no reason we should be enemies. He sat across from me, and I asked him why he had come. He said that the ministry had to deny that they knew I had been planning to visit North Korea and particularly, they had to deny that they had given me permission to go. He requested that I report that I had made the decision to go to North Korea on my own. I said that I would do as he requested, that I would take personal responsibility for the whole affair. I told him not to worry. And from that time, I have never told any reporters or anybody else 
that I had met with the Ministry of National Security before my trip. Today is the first time I am telling this secret. Public opinion criticized the condolence visit. Hearing the public reaction to Consolan's trip, the government reversed its original position. The condolence visit for Kim Il-sung was categorized as unpatriotic, and it was announced that Dr. Park would be punished in accordance with national security laws. After that, he could not enter Korea for four years. Despite this lack of cooperation from the government, Reverend Moon continued with his business projects in the north. Reverend Moon moved forward toward north-south interchange with cultural exchange. The Little Angels folk dance troupe, which had been performing around the world since the troupe was created in 1963, took a 10-day tour to North Korea in May 1998. They were the first cultural troupe to visit the North since the division of the country. Many friends came out to the airport to greet us, waving flags and smiling and welcome, but unlike all previous tours, this time it was amazing to hear that the words of welcome were not in some foreign language, but in Korean. Small angels from South Korea. People thronged to the theater to see them. The historic moment when North Korea first saw the little angels. This was the work of Reverend Sun Myung Moon. We want to say thank you that so many of you came to see our performance today. We hope that our two countries can be reunited as soon as possible so we can meet you often. The performance featured traditional Korean dances, the flower crown dance, springtime, doll dance, fan dance, and the penitent monk. It wasn't just a performance. It was a moment that opened a new road to unification. <laughs> Though they had performed in many countries, since this was the Little Angel's first trip to North Korea, even thinking back on it now, it was a very meaningful trip. It was very meaningful as a beginning point for cultural exchange between North and South Korea. Then in 2000, the Pyongyang student performing troupe visited Seoul. They were invited to Seoul in exchange for the Little Angels visit to Pyongyang two years earlier. They were the first civilian group from North Korea to visit the South since the division of Korea. History was made again. An atmosphere for reconciliation and dialogue was clearly established. We give you our warmest welcome. With the goal of laying the groundwork for a North-South Summit meeting, the celebration performance by the civilian Pyongyang student performance troupe was a milestone in the development of civilian cultural exchange. 20 days before the North-South Summit, May 26th, Pyongyang student performing troupe at the Seoul Arts Center. With the sole performance of the Pyongyang student performing troupe, the goal of cultural exchange, one of the things that Sun Myung Moon and Kim Il-sung had agreed to cooperate on, had been accomplished. This was clearly a major milestone in the history of North-South cultural exchange.
After the successful performance, people were moved. There was a feeling that it would be possible to achieve unity between North and South. It made a considerable contribution toward changing the attitude of the general public. There had been such a feeling of enmity, but meeting North Koreans face to face, they felt we are just the same. Feeling connected as the same Korean people with the same character. From the point of view of creating the attitude that it was necessary to find reconciliation on the government level, the effects of cultural activities do not end with the performance, but carry other results that can affect even government policy. Following this, former President Kim Dae-jung and North Korean Chairman of National Defense Kim Jong-il held a summit meeting in Pyongyang. It was the first summit between North and South in the 55 years since the division of Korea in 1945. <laughs> The summit resulted in the signing of a joint declaration between North and South. Contents of North-South Joint Resolution, Reunions for Divided Families and Civilian Interchange. After that, reunions between divided families, tourist trips to Mount Gungang, civilian joint ventures begin in earnest. Also, ongoing training for authorities in both the North and South and the normalization of relations between North Korea and the United States and Japan. It was the first face-to-face -face talks between the heads of the two countries since the division of the Korean Peninsula in 1948. This could not help but be a historic occasion. After the North-South Summit, joint North-South economic ventures began. However, Reverend Moon had already begun joint ventures with the North. Among them, one economic joint venture was the establishment of Pyonghua Motors. If the North and South cooperate on anything, no matter what it is, and if it helps lead to reunification, what is the disadvantage for us in that? Is it better to wait until they are stronger? But manufacturing machinery, in fact, the most important machinery you can manufacture is automobiles. The automobile industry is the heart of the manufacturing industry. Because dozens, hundreds of parts are needed to make a car, other factories are also needed to manufacture these parts, which helps the industry develop quickly. Pyonghua Motors opened in North Korea in 1998. Chairman of National Defense Kim Jong-il and North Korea's top leaders eagerly welcomed the construction of an automobile factory. The focus was on family cars and passenger vans to be made affordable for as many people as possible. Chairman of National Defense Kim Jong-il named the first model Whistler. Next was Kunku. I imagine that all the cars driving around in Pyongyang today are these two models. Most of them were sold in North Korea, and a small number of them have been sold across the Amrok River and are being used in Manchuria. Among the better hotels in Pyongyang is the Potonggang Hotel, which Reverend Moon is invested in. Reverend Moon has made considerable investments in North Korea. Contributing to the solution to the unification problem from the private sector and discussion with the North are needed. 
Also, it is clear that this is a viewpoint that has not been embraced by many citizens in the South, but unification discussions originating in the private sector are needed, and from the viewpoint of the need for agreement and the question of unification, you can look at this as a way of laying groundwork for these discussions. A lifetime dedicated to world peace activities in various fields. Reverend Moon pursued harmony of religions and through supporting education, working for women's rights, addressing poverty, he carried out work for world peace that reached out in many directions. As a religious leader, Reverend Moon was always concerned about the problems of religions. Conflicts with religious roots are still taking place in many parts of the world. Since the 1960s, Reverend Moon has been proposing that religions work together to contribute to world peace. His interreligious activities are part of this. On September 11, 2001, the heart-stopping attack in the World Trade Center was made by Islamic suicide terrorists. Incidents like this take place around the world due to ideological differences. Reverend Moon emphasized interreligious activities in order to solve this kind of problem. He gathered the faithful from every religious community in order to create the opportunity to reach understanding and harmony beyond the vision of each religion. Many of the foundations that have been set up in the United States are focused on the Middle East and are changing the atmosphere through non-governmental, non-military civilian NGO activities. With that kind of thinking, Reverend Moon started the Middle East Peace Initiative, and I have been working on the forefront of that effort. The Middle East, a focus of special attention. For the past 10 years, since 2003, Reverend Moon has been leading activities to solve the conflicts between religions through dialogue between religions. Building peace and trust within the fabric of society is the most urgent and important task for peace in the Middle East. After that, we held events in the Gaza Strip and at Israel Congress directed at mediating for peace through focusing on core values of religions. We hope to see him very soon in the land of peace and the Terra Sancta. Seven times between September 2003 and May 2004. Peace marches in Israel were held by Reverend Moon in which religious leaders from many religions, including Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Shiksism, Hinduism, and others participated. Out of the whole governmental activities, the UPF are making the most important activity for the peace in the Middle East. I never know about any other non-governmental organization which have this commitment and this massive effort to close people from all the Middle East. Going beyond religion, these people are gathered with united hearts yearning for world peace. They have come to a region of conflict to send their messages of peace. About 3,000 peace-loving people from around the world, from different nationalities and religions, came to Israel answering the call to participate in peace-building activities, and now those 3,000 people are all here. Among them are about 60 heads of state, making the largest foreign delegation in history to visit Israel and Palestine at one time. At the same time, about 17,000 Israelis and Palestinians with peace-loving minds going beyond differences in religion gathered together in Israel's Independence Park. A total of 20,000 people gathered in the Independence Park in Jerusalem to join in a demonstration for peace. After that, representatives of all the major religions joined in a peace march in Israel to emphasize efforts for peace and reconciliation. It was a heart-to-heart -heart peace demonstration with the goal of finding the way to live together in harmony. Reverend Moon viewed struggles between religions as a serious problem and threat to peaceful society and worked to achieve religious harmony. 
1968, the Assembly of the World's Religions was inaugurated in Korea, and Reverend Moon continued his work for cooperation between religions throughout the world. These activities gained accord between many religious leaders and gave them a chance to share their concerns about the path that religion must follow. Supporting academic and cultural activities, particularly with the expansion of the Communist bloc in 1985, the Professor's World Peace Academy, Congress in Geneva, Switzerland, under the theme The Fall of the Soviet Empire, attracted the attention of scholars the world over. He provided a place for people to join hands with scholars from other places without stopping at national borders, but expanding to the international dimension and reaching beyond all academic disciplines as well, with the common goal of peace for all humankind. The Professor's World Peace Academy, formed in 1973, gathered famous scholars from around the world and continues its work today. The International Cultural Foundation was established in 1968, supporting research, seminars and publications on issues of international interest. With our interdisciplinary work, we promoted opportunities for leaders from the academic sphere to meet specialists from other fields in an atmosphere of dynamic interchange. In today's global culture, we must go even further, joining together and thinking creatively to find the fusion of elements from different fields to create new solutions. But when the Academy was founded 30 years ago and began its worldwide agenda of activities of academic research, this was just a germ of an idea. The Professor's World Peace Academy was formed to solve the problems of today's society, settle conflicts between East and West, and to promote world peace through joint research and exchange between scholars. Since the 1970s, PWPA has invited Nobel laureates to academic conferences and has hosted scholarly conferences around the world. Following Reverend Moon's vision, PWPA has held gatherings of scholars reaching beyond the barriers of history, culture, nationality and race. The Collegiate Association for the Research of Principles was founded for university students. CARP supports peacebuilding activities for university students. Reverend Moon supported projects to promote development in underdeveloped nations around the world. As early as 1979, he established the International Relief Friendship Foundation to provide food, medical supplies, food and other necessities to third world countries in Africa and elsewhere. IRFF continues to send relief supplies and support mobile medical teams, technological education, water system development and other projects. Especially in Africa, it provides support for agricultural development, missionary work and operating schools. Impressed by the range of Reverend Moon's activities in Africa, Nigerian President Good Luck Jonathan invited Reverend Moon as a state guest to discuss strategies for peace. Together with his wife, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, Reverend Moon developed women's activities. In 1992, they founded the Women's Federation for World Peace to organize and support activities for solidarity among women. In 1993 and 1994, women from Korea and Japan participated in sisterhood bridge ceremonies, which were followed by bridge ceremonies between Japan and the United States, China and Japan, and other countries. Investment was also made in the training of women as future leaders. Reverend Moon, thinking that women must play a crucial leadership role in achieving world peace, invested in training women for leadership around the world through the 21st Century Women's Leadership Forum. Projects like these continue in every region of the world. They are being hailed for establishing a new standard in women's activities. As the position of women gains prominence and efforts to enhance efforts for the world peace in this context, WFWP has gained recognition from many prominent world figures, including UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, peace-loving global citizen Sun Myung-moon, a life lived for the sake of world peace and unification, Measured against the efforts of other private citizens in the history of the world, the influence of Reverend Moon's work is remarkable. Now Reverend Moon has departed. How will people remember him? 
wielkie szanuję pana Muna. I naturally respect Mr. Moon. Cieszę się, że chce coś robić. I'm very happy that he wants to uh, do something in life, something good. The activity of Reverend Moon is a very important. Why I consider it important? Because start of the insertion of the United Nations. From his youth, Reverend Sun Myung Moon walked the path of a pioneer tearing down the walls of division for the sake of reconciliation and unity. Whether recognized or not, his private engagement with North Korea has contributed to the process of reuniting the Korean Peninsula. In unification movement history, he has been a trailblazer. In his era spanning two centuries, Sun Myung Moon sought to resolve the conflicts between peoples. His life of 90 years was dedicated to peace and the reunification of his homeland. Now it is clear that as a result of his life, he has left behind many things to think about and many things to do.